that song is always so convicting to me if you just listen to the words of it. Flowing from my heart are the issues of my heart. So it always makes me step back and ask, what's flowing from my heart? What issues do I have in my heart? Is love flowing from my heart or what is flowing? But whatever the songwriter had flowing from his heart, he categorized it all as gratefulness. Oh, that's, a, that's a powerful song. Especially today. When I think about when I think about what it takes to be married for one day. One day. Righteously married. I'm, I'm not talking about just go through the ceremony. I'm talking about to be righteously married for one day. Righteous being the op operating word. Being married is hard, but it's worth it. It's a blessing. And when you can make it, have any longevity in a, in a marriage, at some point you got to just stop and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you I didn't mess this up. Thank you. When I got mad, I didn't stay mad. <laughs> Not that she's ever been mad before at me. I, mean, I just want to straighten that out now. No, seriously, thank you for how good you've been in our life. Can I, can I confess something to y'all? Don't tell Karen. But when I got married, I didn't know what I was doing. I did. I was drifting on a field. It was a good field, floating on emotion. I wanted to be with her, but I had no idea what I was locking in for. Didn't take real long for me to realize that this was more than I had anticipated. I don't think I'm the only one in the room. But all I can say is thank God she didn't give up on me. I finally got it together. I figured it out. And I, feel, I realized it wasn't about me. As long as I was making it about me, we were going to have problems. But when I figured it out that it was about us, then that worked it all out. I'm telling you, that was liberating. Stop trying to have it your way every day, all day. So I thought I would say a few words about marriage today, since we are still in worship. And wow, that was a beautiful example. I, I think that was wonderful. I want to go in the scriptures and show you a few things, and then we're going to get you out of here, get you on your way. There was a song that was written. You know, I like songs. It was written by a man named Ch uh, Chuck Jackson and Marvin Yancey. And it came out in April of 1975. That was my, that was the beginning of my heyday. The 70s and 80s was a good time. That's when folk could sing for real. Yeah without all the synthesizers, and they just stand up and sing at a microphone and just, and just could go. Every dude that was cool that was dating wanted to sing like somebody. There were a whole lot of guy groups out there, male groups out there, and some women groups as well, but uh, 
you couldn't beat them temps and them satellites and all them boys. They were bad at that time. But, but one woman came in and stole the show. At the time, the, re, the, reigning, the reigning champ of female singers was Riri. Yeah, she was. She said, what you need, baby, I got it. She sang that, all right? But she said a lot of things, and no one could dethrone her until this song came along. This song, Stris's biggest song, maybe of her career, ended up being the number one R&B song, even rose to the number six on the pop charts, helped her to become the Grammy Award winner for the best new artist that year. Uh, person who had dominated it before that was Aretha Franklin. And she sang this song about her expectation in an upcoming relationship. This is the song that won. It was about love. It was about hope. It was about the possibilities that could exist. Then the title of the song was This Will Be. The songstress was Natalie Cole. Yeah. yeah. She had serious singing in her background. She struggled. But on that day, she was married three times herself. But on that day when she sang that song, she talked about what I hope for in a relationship. And today, that's what I thought we should talk about in terms of marriage, because when we step to that stage and we say I do wherever we are, all we can do is hope for something have some expectation. And so I want to talk about this will be, but the, the, the truth of the matter is it will be based on what you put in it. I hope you'll hear me now. Yeah, what you put in it. It's not already formulated. God has not ordained failure into your marriage, nor he, has he ordained success if you don't do what you're supposed to do. These are things that are well within our control, but we've got to follow the formula. I want to say it's like baking a cake if you know the right ingredients to put in because everybody can't follow the same cake baking uh, uh, recipe. You can have the same recipe and it not come out with the same product. All right? You not use the same ingredients. You don't use the heat high enough. You don't use the right baking pan. There's so many variables. And so you can look at Calvin and Doris Haynes and say, we want to be married 68 plus years just like them, but you don't know all the ingredients that have gone into 68 years of being married. And so don't, don't, don't look at others and say, I wish I was like them because you don't know what that is. You just want God to bless you as he sees fit to bless you. But one of the reasons we need to talk about this is because the church is not being honest with the community and it has stepped away from its responsibility to next generations. We haven't let people know that solid, healthy marriages in our community are the foundation of our community. That's the foundation. There's no doubt about it. When we have solid households, then everything else in the community is healthier, particularly the church, particularly the church. But the church has a vital role to play in making sure that marriages are good. Research shows clearly that divorces are harmful to people for the long haul. Now, I didn't come today to bash divorces. And, and listen, listen, I, I'm a lawyer. I've helped people get divorces before under certain circumstances, but that's not what I came to talk about. Most of the time, I was counseling them another way. But there are times when separation becomes what needs to happen for safety and other reasons. But that's not what's happening in our community. We're not divorcing because of those circumstances. It's convenience. Yeah, it's, I'm tired of him. Now, I can come back up here with the 25 that were standing up here and ask each one of them, I guarantee you, to a person. They would say, yeah, that was the day I was tired of her or him. The question is, what did you do? How did you respond to that? What becomes our response determines how far we move. And that's why the church has to play a vital role in marriage. We've got to have recommitment ceremonies. We've got to have marriage counseling. We've got to have marriage support. 
We got to let children know that marriage is a healthy, healthy institution and something they should aspire to. We need to understand in our efforts, in our ministries, that marriage has a purpose. It's not something to shy away from. It's something to look forward to. And we got to make sure that we support marriage enrichment, marriage mentoring. Everybody hasn't had a solid couple to look toward as mentors. If your parents were in a decent marriage, that's good. Perhaps you have an example that you can look to. But everybody doesn't have that as an example. Some people just fell in love, and they didn't have a blueprint to work from. And so they start seeking places to go and people to find. And that's why a church ought to be a solid place for them to come and find healthy examples of good marriage. Not perfect. If you're looking for a perfect marriage, you won't ever find it. It does not exist because people aren't perfect. And there's no way you can get a perfect marriage out of imperfect people. But some people start the foundation of their relationship in the wrong place. I would suggest to you that even if you weren't thinking about the Lord when y'all met, sooner or later you need to turn to him. You need to try to get to the Lord. If you can learn about him, he's got a blueprint for keeping people together. Guess what? If you didn't know this, he started marriage. He brought Adam and Eve together by bringing Eve to Adam. That's scripture. I didn't, bring, I didn't make that up. He foreordained that marriage was a good thing and started the ability to have a family. Genesis 1 and 28 reads, God blessed the man and the woman and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Ideal relationship. God brought a woman to a man. Identic I I I ironically, the woman came out of the man, out of the man. In fact, one theologian says that a woman is a female man. All right? That's how close they are. That's why the songwriter could sing, as we say, flesh of my flesh. Bone of my bone. The truth of the matter is this. When two, couples, when a, two people get together and become a couple, the goal is for them to become one. I know you say it's physically impossible for them to become one in flesh. And it is. But what you want to do is have a melding or a mending of the attitudes and minds and principles and precepts and love. I've told couples before, and I'll say this to you right now, when you grow together, it's almost as if you can't tell one from another. That's how close the two of you will become. Now, the reason why we can't do that, you're not going to like me when I say that, is because we like what we got so much that we don't want to give up what we got for what he or she had. And so it's hard to blend together when it's all about me. Selfishness is one of the reasons why we can't blend the two people together. Now don't be mad at him or her for, saying, for, for me saying that. That's just the truth. The truth is we typically want it all our way. And we want it all our way that can create friction within a couple. Matthew 19, 4 and 6 says this, At the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one. The act of unifying in marriage, the act of coming together in marriage, is an act of saying we want to be one. And there's no way you can do it from a fleshly standpoint. It has to be one in terms of spirit. And once you can be together in terms of spirit, the spirit guiding the flesh can make you seem, seem as one. Interestingly, after the scripture talks about the two people becoming together as one in terms of spirit, the next focus that Jesus turns to is those people having children. So once we're together on that accord, the next section says, then let the little children come unto me and hinder them. And hinder them. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. So let me tell you, and we didn't get this right, 
There is a perfect order to families being put together. The order is for mama and daddy to get together and become one, and then here comes baby. Now, y'all don't want to hear that. In 2019, the order is what the order is. You know, if you had a babies and then get together. But I came to tell you that the Bible says, now, I'm standing here, me and Karen been married for 32 years. Our oldest child is 35. You do the math on that, right? I didn't come to point the finger at anybody. I just came to tell you that there is an order that you're supposed to follow. And if you follow that order, then things line up and fall in place. That doesn't point the finger at you. That just says there's a way to do it. We got a biblical responsibility to do better, to uphold the marriage standard. And I'm telling you the marriage standard, we need to be training couples, we need to be helping folks who want to be engaged or intend to be married, with one, married to one another. And then once married, we got to do some enrichment. But why is marriage important? Why, why is it important? Well, if this is going to be the marriage that you hope for it to be, then there's some things you have got to put into your relationship to make it better. And I guarantee you each one of these couples that was just standing up here can come up and be experts on this, and they can probably tell you, Absolutely, this is right. But the first thing you got to do, and you got to know this, this has to be included in your relationship. And I'm so sad that I allowed too many years of my marriage to go by without realizing the significance of this one thing. Too many years went by. You have got to learn to listen to one another. That's the first thing. You got to learn how to communicate. Learning to communicate is essential. Listening to each other is essential. The scripture says it pretty clear. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and then slow to become angry. All of that falls in place if you listen. Listen. Let me let you in on something. Listening doesn't always have to do with your ears. All right? Sometimes silence is talking. Sometimes silence is telling you what you need to know. You don't always have to say a word to be heard. Oh, y'all know what I'm talking about now. Oh, oh, I, I can make it plain. I, I can make it plain for you now. Whenever there's been trouble in the hut, the fact that she ain't said nothing says a whole lot. You don't have to say, what's wrong with you? Because you already know what's wrong with you. And a tap on the shoulder that goes unheeded speaks volumes. In other words, I'm not talking to you right now. And not talking to you right now tells you something's wrong with me. You haven't listened to me. You haven't heard me. Listening becomes imperative. Not only that, as you stay married, listening becomes more significant, not with the ears, but with the heart. All right? I, I've learned to hear what she says because I know her heart, and I know where she's coming from before she even goes there. I've heard in her conversations, not necessarily with me, but ear hustling on conversations with other folk, what is significant to her. Because sometimes those conversations don't come out so good to me. Sometimes it's ear hustling on conversations with her sisters or a friend, and I find out, I need to tighten this up because this isn't what she likes. But listening is important. For women in particular, listening is important. In our society, in our society, we struggle in the, in the black community anyway. Black men have traditionally not gotten the respect from society that we believe is important. And so because of that, because of that, we can tend to be in our own hut, making sure we get heard. That type of domineering attitude
can sometimes drown out others who need to be heard. We don't always listen like we should. And so it's important. If this will be what you expect it to be, then listening to each other is important. Not only is listening important to each other, listening to God is important. Like I said earlier, you may not have, you may not have been talking to the Lord. When we stood there and married in front of Cicero Moore and George Jones in Tuskegee back in 1986, we were trying to get through it. All right, we weren't necessarily listening to the Lord. I'm going to be honest with you, we weren't spiritually focused at that time. That's just the truth. If you were, I thank God for you. And I know some of you were mature enough to be there at that point. I wasn't. I just thank God that he held me in his hand long enough that I could figure out what I had messed up, all right? But the same thing is true. It's easy to rush in church and tell God everything you need. What's harder is listening to God so he can tell you what he expects of you and what he wants you to do. Um, it's important to note that when Jesus first gave the disciples the example of prayer, this is what he said. He gave three petitions off the, off the top. Uh, when he taught them, he said, hallowed be thy name first, second was thy kingdom come, and third was thy will be done. Those three things. Now I want you to notice something. The first three things that Jesus Christ did when he taught them how to pray was to, teach, to listen to God. All right? Listen to God. Hallowed be your name, Lord. Your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done, Lord. All those things we pray before we ever get to the next part of the prayer where we start asking for prayers for ourselves. So before we move forward on anything, we need to make sure we're on God's agenda and we're doing what God wants us to do. And then we can start saying, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive me for my sins and guide me in the way you want me to go, but only after we do what he wants us to do. Now that's a maturation that has come about. It didn't just come about because I felt the need that the Lord was calling me to preach. You don't have to be a preacher to be doing the Lord's will. Every one of us who say we are believers in Christ Jesus should be in fact trying to do his will. As any father, know this, it doesn't matter how much you pray. Any, anyone in here who is a parent knows this. It don't matter how much your children beg you for some things. You're just not going to give it to them. And I don't know what makes us think that the Lord is any different. We can beg and ask and cry and plead and promise and do everything. And still the Lord says, no, I'm not going to give that to you, first of all, because it's, it doesn't serve any purpose other than for your self-gratification and two, you don't need it. It doesn't, it doesn't edify anybody. It's just something you're begging for. The Lord is good to us in that way and that he grants sometimes very little to us or nothing at all because he is blessing us with those things that we need and not always, not ra and rarely the things that we just, we just want. He knows us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And that's why we need to listen to him because since we know him, I mean, since he knows us, he knows what's best for us. I can tell you again, like a child, when you have children, you know your children and you know they always come in. Like right now, you can have a small child and already his personality or her personality is coming forth. And you know how they act when they get sleepy. You know how they behave. You know they get cranky. You know they start whining. I don't know what makes you think that you get different when you get older. You still have the same kind of responses, and the Lord knows how to respond to you, and he blesses you accordingly. All right? One way you can learn how to listen to God as a couple is to learn to pray together. All right? Now, I know that sounds perfect. And yet, we, the people say we pray together, we hold hands and pray together every day before we leave the house. That's wonderful. If you can do that, that's great. But praying together doesn't mean you have to pray out loud together. 
Okay? You can pray together. You can focus on prayer in the morning. You don't have to stop in the middle of your day. As long as you know both of you focus on prayer in the morning. Now, I love the unity of both of you coming together and being on one accord. I also understand the reality of 6 to 8 o'clock in the morning. And I know how difficult that can be to get up, particularly when you got little children running around. You may not always be able to pause and get together, but you can pray while you're bathing a child or dressing a child. You can pray while you're dressing yourself and getting ready. You can pray while you got something in the microwave. You can pray while you're driving to work. You can pray as you're walking in the, in, into work. You can pray together as long as your focus is on prayer. You don't have to be standing in one another's face to do that. So you got to learn how to listen to each other. You got to learn how to listen to God. Most significantly, you got to learn how to forgive one another. Forgiving one another. Forgiving one another is crucial to growing in a relationship. Colossians 3, 13 and 14 reads, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievance you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect, perfect harmony. Forgiveness is one of the hardest things we do. It's, it's, it's so difficult. Because there are times when we have legitimately been harmed. When we have legitimately been hurt. And we feel and may be justified in knowing that somebody needs to pay because they hurt me. Can I tell you that there are some things in life you will never be given recompense for? Somebody hurts your feelings, they apologize. Your feelings are still hurt. The only way you move on from that is by your change of heart, not by the fact that they said something. You still have to forgive them. But one of the ways you can think about knowing how to forgive other folk if you're a believer is simply reminding yourself how much you've been forgiven. Most people who find themselves on victim's standpoint always take that place as if they've never harmed anybody or done any wrong to anybody. Can I tell you something? All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. And God has forgiven us of much more than we could ever think or imagine. And so when we start talking about somebody hurting our feelings, imagine what we've done to someone else. Forgiveness, look at this, you should know this, forgiveness is a unique characteristic in Christianity. You won't find it in other religions, forgiving people, all right? It doesn't show up in other faiths. We got to always remember that part of our Christian journey, part of our walk is knowing how to forgive. How do I know that? Because if you say you're a Christian, which means you're a follower of Christ, the last thing he said, one of the last things he said when he walked on this earth is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I want to remind you that he wasn't talking about people who had just said something negative about him. He wasn't talking about people who had called him out of his name. He was talking about the very people who were killing him. Forgive them, for they have no idea what they're doing right now. Forgiveness, learning to forgive one another, is in fact, is in fact, part of making sure this will be the kind of marriage you want it to be. We also need to learn how to submit to one another. Now, every time I say that, in any context talking about marriage, submission, the first thing people learn, think about is physical contact or sex. Now, while that is part of a relationship and a healthy part, that's not the only meaning of submission, all right? Submission is a sign of love and respect. Love and respect. Maybe this example will help you understand it. There is an organization, a national organization called Campus Crusade. It was started by a gentleman who's so on most college campuses, Campus Crusade for Christ. The guy who started it is a man named Bill Bright, who has been known in evangelistic circles for, 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 for years. 
He's the founder and CEO of this major ministry. And yet, it's common practice for him at the end of any meeting, as soon as it's about to end, he'll turn to the person he was meeting with and say, now tell me what I can do for you. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that what I'm talking about to you is important enough for you to stop your busy day and for you to know, want to know what you can do to help me? And so that's a great example for us when it comes to learning how to submit to one another. It's not always what your spouse can do for you. Okay. All right? They're not just there for your service, for your benefit. If we can learn how to ask our spouse, tell me what I can do for you. How can I make life better for you? Tell me what I can do to make today better for you. How can I ease some of what you got on your mind today? If we can learn how to put others first, then that helps us understand what submission is. Now, submission does have some limits. But I guarantee you, as you grow older and closer together, you'll learn how to set those limits in every respect. The last thing I want to tell you that happens, if you want to make this be what it's going to be, learning how to listen to each other, learning how to listen to God, learning how to forgive one another, learning how to submit to one another. And the last thing you need to do, and this is our responsibility, I was extremely proud. This is personal. Standing on this pulpit a few minutes ago. And I was looking in Karen's eyes and thanking God for how he's blessed us all these many years. But I couldn't help but out of the corner of my eye see our baby standing there making the same commitment to her husband. I know other couples who were doing the same thing. We're saying our vows, but we've also taught the next generation that this is worthy to be done. This is something that is valuable. We have a responsibility of teaching the next generation that this is what God wants us to do. This is a part of what he expects us to do. Look at this, Deuteronomy. Chapter 6, verses 4 through 7 says uh, that God wanted certain things taught to the children of Israel as they were coming out of the bondage of Egypt and coming out of the wandering period in the desert. He said, before you take them into that land with those houses they didn't build, those vineyards they didn't plant, and drinking out of those wells that they didn't dig, before you put them in that place, I want you to teach them some things. Because they'll get over in that space where they have uh, not had any sweat equity in anything, where they haven't had to go through anything, where they haven't had to pick up anything, all was given to them. He said, I want you to teach them about me being the one that brought you over, about me being the one who carried you out on my wings. I want you to teach them about me being the one who lit a fire in the desert at night so you could see. I want you to tell them that God has been the one who designated you as the one that he loves. Make sure they understand that. Teach every generation. Talk to them about it. The Bible says he got really, really familiar in his writing. Moses wrote this. And Moses was told, talk to them about it when you're at home. Talk to them about it when you're cooking and when you're going by the way. Every activity you're in, tell your children how good God has been. I'm telling you, you're missing, you're missing, you're missing. Let your children get tired of you talking about God. Yeah, get on their nerves talking about God. Tell them to take it up with God if they're tired of it. All right? But don't you stop telling them how good God has been to you. That is if you understand how good he's been. Yeah, we got to pray before we eat because if we didn't put the food on the table ourselves. We need to thank God for what he's done. You don't understand what happens when I got to get up when it's dark and I got to lay down when it's dark and all you do is run to the refrigerator and open it and stuff comes out of it. God is the one who brought me through this. You got to teach your children that. They don't understand how you put the Sprite in the refrigerator. But you got to teach them. 
how it comes. And guess what? They don't have to be married very long. God has a funny way of bringing that thing around because we bought Kool-Aid. You can make a lot of Kool-Aid out of 15 cent sack. Yeah, they gotta buy all that infamil. All that expensive milk that costs so, yeah. God will teach them how to pray. He'll give them a, he'll give them a foundation for knowing he's important. They know they water that milk down so it go further than it's supposed to because that's how it is, that's how life is. I know we've been there before. Teach the next generation. We haven't been doing that. Why is marriage important? It's important because throughout the Bible, the marriage relationship between husband and between wife is a metaphor, comparison of the relationship that Christ has had with the church. And just like, just like you just saw us, all 25 of us, stepped down from this platform and we came here and we met our brides. I came to tell you one day, Christ is going to step down. And he's going to meet his bride. And guess who his bride is? His bride is the church. It's those of us who love him. He's going to come grab us by the hand and he's going to whisk us away to forever. And there we will be with him. Can I tell you? It's just like the storybook said. We'll live happily ever after with the Lord in the ever after. But you got to know him. You got to appreciate what he's done. Just like any other marriage, this marriage between Christ and the church comes with sacrifice. He had to give something in order to save us. It just didn't come cheap. And his sermon didn't come free. He was willing, like any good husband, to lay his life down on the line for his bride. Christ laid down his life for you and me, the church. And I came to tell you that he's waiting for us. He's coming back for us. He loves us. He adores us. And he's going to come and rescue us from all of this stuff down here. So my question is, are you ready? Have you accepted his gift? Have you accepted the fact that he died for you? He made covenant with our forefathers. Covenant. When he brought them out of Egypt, he made covenant. He hadn't broken his covenant. He's still true to his word. He made covenant that says, I'm going to have you as my people. My question is, are you a part of the household of Christ? Because if you are, he's coming back for you. If you've never accepted him as your personal Savior, you didn't know before today that Christ died for you and was crucified for you, then I came to validate that knowledge today that he did, in fact, live and die for us. He was crucified, stayed on the cross, until heaven was satisfied that the debt of sin had been paid. My Bible says he died and was placed in a tomb. Stayed in that tomb from Friday evening until Sunday morning. On Sunday morning, God's sense of justice was satisfied. He resurrected Jesus, put life in him, gave him the keys to the kingdom told him that all power in heaven and on earth was his. He reigns now sitting on the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and for me. One day, he's coming back to get us all. And so if you've never given your life to him or accepted that, then today is the day I invite you to become a part of his family. Maybe you've already had a, a relationship with him and you've been looking for a church family. I urge you to try us. We're not perfect, but we're striving to be the friendliest church from the parking lot to the pulpit. Whatever the case may be, the doors of our church are wide open. Whosoever will, let them come right now. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. 